So uh, here we are at the first Sunday in Lent. And as everybody within hearing distance knows, the first Sunday of Lent is always an account of the temptation of Jesus. John's gospel omits it. Matthew and Luke detail the temptations. Jesus uh, is tempted by Satan to turn stones to bread, to, to worship Satan, to hurl himself off the temple pinnacle. But the first gospel account of a lot of things are often skeletal. Um, Mark has a tendency to omit elaboration. And so today's account um, may be short, but it isn't simple. Uh, the text today actually has two very clear sections, the temptation in verses 12 and 13, and Jesus' first sermon in verses 14 and 15. Um, I think of it as the temptation in the teaching or the prayer in the preaching. You can think about that however you'd like to. <clears throat> and I myself was um, tempted to offer a reflection on the Greek word for repent, metanoia, but you're going to hear a lot about that over the next six weeks. So instead, what I'm going to do is a little strange. I'm going to treat verses 14 and 15 first. That's the preaching section. And then I want to concentrate on verses 12 and 13. And, and what I want to do is to point out to you how I think that Mark is linking the beginning of the ministry of Jesus with the story of salvation history in Israel, all of it, in two verses. Um, so fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. <clears throat> um, the, the second two verses first, uh, 1, 14, and 15, present uh, Jesus' theological agenda. And there are two simple sentences and 15 words in all. So preachers attend. Two sentences, 15 words, the whole message. Um, and what they do is to give us two facts and two acts that are essential to Mark's narrative and Mark's Christian theology. So there are two facts. First, the time is fulfilled. And the word for um, time indicates a particular point in time. In other words, it's not random. It's a point in time that was prepared for. And the word for fulfilled means um, brought to completion or, per or perfected. So the time is perfected. That's the first point. And the second is um, the kingdom of God has come near. And of course, you know that kingdom of God is the substance of Jesus preaching and teaching through the whole gospel. So what God wants to communicate to human beings is at hand. It's close by. It's present because Jesus himself is present. So those two facts call for a specific re response, and that's the two acts. And the two acts are very simply presented. Number one, repent, and number two, believe the gospel. Those are Greek imperatives. Those are not polite requests. Those are commands. Um, and note that repentance precedes belief. We recognize that there's something wrong, and we initiate activity, action to change it. And that um, new beginning is really the beginning of belief. So if you're in the African-American church, what we've got here is the facts and the acts. That's the preaching of Jesus in a nutshell. What I want to talk about in a little bit more detail are the two preceding verses of this. Um, at the high spiritual experience of Jesus' baptism by John, the heavenly voice confirms Jesus' identity. Of course, we get another heavenly voice in the transfiguration. If you belong to the Anglican and Episcopal Church or use the common lectionary, the Sunday before Lent for us is always Transfiguration Sunday. So we have the hopeful image of the transfigured Jesus before we start the slog to Jerusalem. In Mark, Jesus is the only person who hears the heavenly voice. 
And the point is, he knows who he is, but um, everybody in the narrative has to discover his identity by following him, by being with him. And so there is a practical Lenten practice, stay with Jesus. Immediately, which is Mark's favorite word, the spirit drove him into the wilderness. Boy, this, this is just showing us how Jesus' life and experience is like ours. You know, we have highs and we have lows, the beautiful liturgy and then the laundry. So right at the beginning, we, we are brought into um, congruence with the life of Jesus. So what does it mean? And I think this is in some ways the most um perplexing part of these two verses. What does it mean that Jesus was driven out into the wilderness? You know, it's kind of like an image of the shepherd driving the sheep out or the cowboys making the cows go out into the wilderness. <clears throat> and it, it bothers people. But what I would like to suggest that perhaps Jesus uh, going out into the wilderness was volitional, not forced that he chose it. Jesus is so drawn to the voice that he has to go out into the wilderness to pursue the meaning of what he has heard. It's, it's parallel in religious life where, where we think we've been called to religious life or, priest, or priesthood or a particular ministry, but we really have to sort it out. And I'm wondering if this is really what's happening here. Because Mark's word uh, wilderness, eremos, in the Greek is as much a sociological term as it is a geographical one. Um, it, it implies an uninhabited place, not necessarily one that's sandy and hot during the day and cold at night. But it's sociologically an uninhabited place, a place of silences, a place without distractions. So Mark's gospel began with a quotation from Isaiah 43, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, in Jesus' first action that we see in the gospel of Mark, I wonder if he isn't motivated by this knowledge of scripture. You know, prepare the way of the Lord, go out into the wilderness. The Baptist too appeared in the wilderness to preach. <clears throat> so that this idea that wilderness initiates the lives of both John and Jesus is important in Mark because John gets more verses in Mark um, than anybody but Jesus. So there's Jesus and then John as the second person with lots of space attended to him. Mark's text, I think, alludes to the wilderness experience. Another way, what do you think the early Jewish Christian readers of Mark would have thought when they heard the phrase, he was in the wilderness for 40 days? I think it's an allusion to Moses and the 40 days of the Hebrew children in the wilderness. And I think it's intentional. There, Yahweh became present to them, fed them, led them, gave them the law. Perhaps you might also think of Elijah's desert time in which he, remember, was fed by the raven. Mark is placing Jesus right at the beginning of the gospel in the context of salvation history with Moses the lawgiver and Elijah the prophet. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Tempted by Satan is dark mark and foreshadowing. After he called the disciples in his first teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus uh, exercises and triumphs over unclean spirits. I think that he was in the wilderness with the wild beasts. I think that's positive. 
I don't think we're being told that, oh gosh, Jesus is there and the lions are salivating in the, in the background. With <clears throat> the preposition meta in Greek has as its first definition in company with or among or on the side of. I'm suggesting that the reference is not necessarily to endangerment, but it may be another in a series of Markan attempts to link Jesus with the Ur events of Israel. Do you remember the Garden of Eden story when humans lived in harmony with the animals? And now Jesus is with the beasts? It's another way of thinking about this. It's another way of thinking um, differently from what maybe we thought about being driven into the wilderness. Um, or maybe it's a veiled reference to Noah. I think this is, I'm, I'm a little shakier ground here, but, but, um, but Noah is the human being who saved animals. And in the third chapter of 1 Peter, actually Peter links Jesus and Noah. But what I think we've got here is something like darkness to dawning to full sun. We start with Satan. We go to the nice animals that Jesus is in the desert with. And then we have the angels who come to minister to him. Everybody gets in the act in some way. The good people, the neutral animals, and, and the angelic hosts. Um, and, and actually, when the new, new Revised Standard says that the angels waited on him, I immediately thought of servants, you know, like ladies in waiting in medieval stories, um, helpers. The Greek word waited, from whence cometh the verb diakoneo, from which we get deacon, might well be a foreshadowing of the disciples, those who accompany and like Peter, Peter's mother-in-law, serve Jesus and serve others. I'm trying to rehabilitate the story a little bit and to show us how that some of the images that we thought were, were scary might well be um, kind of of literary and theological historical significance. The beginning of Mark's gospel, I think, is locating Jesus in the narrative of salvation history. It starts with, with a quotation from the prophets. It gives us a glimpse of Eden, of the ecosphere restored. Jesus is with the animals. We see Moses in Elijah, the law and the prophets. We see Israel's wilderness sojourn. And dare I suggest it might foreshadow the angels at the empty tomb at the end of Mark's story? I mean, is this like a massive book ending or inclusion? He starts with the angels and the angels are there at the very end of the story as well. Um, Mark's gospel doesn't give us the specifics of the temptation of Jesus, but it gives us a very clear context and a very important context for the unfolding of his life. So, what does all of this mean for us as we begin our Lenten journey? Well, we all have times of wilderness and wild beasts, if you follow the more traditional interpretation of the story. There are times when we're tempted, when our burdens are too heavy to carry, our sorrows are overwhelming, our prayers seem unanswered, and the temptation is to sin big. Remember that the wild beasts in those occasions might not be dangers. They might be accompaniers. They might be helpers. They might be encouragers that are appearing to us in unlikely persons and places. Maybe that little preposition with suggests something new about who our Lenten companions might be. Mark's text suggests that we look for them. Most of us have been visited by unlikely angels that saved the day. I have several stories I won't tell you because 
it'll take too long. Um, most of us have have had visitations by unlikely angels. Um, the Hebrew letter, remember, defines angels as spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. They're around, and Mark is saying, um, watch for them, expect them. Let's watch for them and expect them in Lent. Lent has been dramatically impressed on our foreheads by the ashes that we are. And some of the Lenten liturgies in some of our Christian traditions include these words, turn away from sin and toward the loving arms of your God. Lent reminds us that like the prodigal's loving father in Luke, God is on the road waiting with open arms for us to come home, home to the Easter feast. Lent is another chance for us to turn around, to approach the throne of grace and Jesus who suffers with us and waits for us. Jesus writes the Hebrew letter, was in every respect tested as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lent, I think, is asking us to walk the way of Jesus um, with all those positive images of the help that Jesus received in the wilderness. Without his assured presence with us, we couldn't undertake the kind of self-examination and honesty with ourselves and about ourselves that Easter repentance requires of us. But Lent's very good news in these four short verses in Mark um, is that the kingdom of God is near and that we can still repent and we can believe afresh if we're on shaky terms with our faith or if we have a sense that we've lost our faith. Maybe Lent is a good time to, to start looking for it again. We can endure Lent as a time of aridity and thirst and wandering and giving up and all those negative things, or we can celebrate Lent as the opportunity to relent, to repent and to believe and to listen for the voice that initiated Jesus' ministry. I think Lent offers us in a special way, the companion and comfort of Jesus Christ. And so may God grant us all a holy and blessed and joyful Lent.